So let's take lust. <laughs> what is lust? Let's see. Lust in, in the Encyclopedia Britannica, they go lust or an inordinate or illicit sexual desire. Now, what does it mean to have an inordinate sexual desire? Or for that matter, an illicit sexual desire. Now, you can kind of get what an illicit sexual desire is, but why is the desire wrong? What, what is the purpose? I, remember, this is one of the most sinful things you can do in life. This is one of the most horrible things you can do in life. In Wikipedia, it says it's an intense longing. It is usually thought of as an intense or unbridled sexual desire, which may lead, God forbid, to fornification, including adultery, rape, bestiality, and other sinful sexual acts. That's what Wikipedia says. Right? Now, sexual desire is one of those pleasurable experiences one can have. Why is this, what's wrong with it? Now, you can have, you can say rape, bestiality, whatever, are wrong. You can even say adultery is wrong for a different reason than Christianity says. But why is the lust itself, why is that bad? When it elicits such intense pleasure, and it actually does lead one to pursue, quote, fornication. <laughs> fornication. Which is good. For objectivism, sex is good. Sex is pleasure. Sex is life-affirming. Sex is the most intense pleasure one can have. It's both spiritual and physical, and it's wonderful. Why is Christianity so concerned about fornication? Fornication means sex outside of marriage. Why do they care? Why do they deny us the pleasure of sex? Because they want to deny us pleasure. They understand that it's a need, and therefore they allow it in a particular context, marriage, for a particular purpose primarily, having babies and satisfying our animalistic need. But at the heart of this, at the heart of this is the rejection of pleasure, the rejection of ecstasy, the rejection of enjoyment, the rejection of human happiness. I mean, I, I, my attitude towards this is exact the opposite. I mean, to lust, that is to have strong sexual feelings towards somebody, is wonderful. Sometimes you have, you're not going to, um, uh, you're not going to experience it. You, you, that is, you're not going to um, act on it because the other party might be married, might be unavailable, might be, might not share your lust for them, right? But having that feeling is a positive feeling. Somebody says meth and heroin are more pleasurable than any activity according to biology. True. But that's why I said pleasure that doesn't undermine everything else in your life. I don't know if meth and heroin are the most pleasurable. I have no idea. But they clearly provide you with some super high chemical high. They, they certainly lack the, the um, uh, spiritual aspect that you would get from sex. But they do give you some kind of, some kind of massive buzz, right? But that's why I emphasized if, if meth and heroin didn't affect your ability to reason, didn't affect your ability to live a good life, then there'd be nothing wrong with them, right? They, we avoid meth and heroin not because they're pleasurable, at least I avoid meth and heroin, not because they are pleasurable. If they were just pleasurable, if that was the only characteristic they had, then why not? You avoid them because they're addictive. You avoid them because while you're under, you're out of control. You are not rational. You cannot use your mind effectively. And therefore, you avoid them. 
But if you could get some kind of spark of pleasure without those costs, why not? Why wouldn't you do it? So my focus is on the pleasure. And, and, and I, I've, I've often said people should have sex out of marriage. I mean, I don't think that's an unpopular view these days. I think even, uh, I think it's pretty mainstream. But it's not mainstream for anybody who believes in the seven deadly sins. Fornication is definitely a part of lust. Now, Wikipedia continues to say, however, lust could also mean other forms of our bridal desire, such as for money or power. We'll get to that when we get to greed, right? But what does unbridled desire mean? Unbridled from what? Unbridled for what? Unbridled for duty? Unbridled for service? Unbridled from sacrifice? Why is the desire for money and power bad? Well, power arguably is bad, but Sex is not short term. So, uh, so it's a I mean, the, the physical pleasure is short term. The spiritual pleasure is not short term. You build a relationship with some, somebody through sex that can last a lifetime. And that is not short term. That is part of the building of mechanism. You wouldn't have the kind of relationship that a, a loving husband and wife have over, or, or any couple have over a, a long period of time without the fact that they also share this powerful, sh quote, short term thing. But that short term has incredible implications for the long term. It's a, whereas drugs are value destroying, sex is value adding. Again, when done with the right person, right time. Right person. Time, place, that's pretty flexible. All right. Um, Yeah, Shazbot writes, and this is it's this is a movie I highly recommend, but you got to watch the series first because it's like the it's like a, 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 a sequel to a TV series. Uh, the movie is Serenity. The TV series was somebody will remind me, but, but, but the, 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 and the quote is, "I'm going to grant your greatest wish. I'm going to show you a world without sin. And a world without sin, by their definition, means a world without self-interest." A world without reason, a world without pleasure, a world without ambition, a world without values. That's what it means in the Christian context. And that's why Christianity knows that it's impossible. And of course, in the movie, it's a world in which everyone stops living. It's a world in which everybody's dead because there is no such a world because it goes against human life. Firefly is the name of the series. Firefly is an excellent series. I love that show. Uh, you can get it. Uh, you can get it. I think you can get it streaming. You can definitely get it on DVDs and stuff. It's a. It's a great show. Um, and Serenity was a great sequel to it. I thought it was a nice way to wrap up the story. I wish it had continued because I. I loved those characters. So, lust is a direct attack on human pleasure direct attack on the spiritual and physical wonder that is sex. Dante defined lust as a disordered love for individuals. It is generally thought the least serious capital sin because you can't stop it. As it is an abuse of a faculty that humans share with animals. Yeah, we're animals, can't help it. And sins of the flesh are less grievous than spiritual sins. Yeah. I, I, the, the way to, uh, on the other hand, the way to purge yourself of these sinful desires, sinful emotions. In, uh, in, in Dante's Purgatorio, um, you walk through flames, you burn yourself alive, in order to uh, rid yourself of the lustful thoughts. Um, Augustine, Augustine, uh, used to roll in the snow, whip himself, whip himself, self-torture, self 
has often been a practice, uh, I think, uh, among, uh, among Christians in order to rid themselves of lustful sexual desires. To rid themselves of pleasure. And the way to rid yourself of pleasure is to engage in pain. Try to be lustful while you're freezing cold or while you're being hit and brutalized by your own whip. So, notice, you'll notice that all of these are anti-individual. Anti-individual pleasure, anti-individual success, anti-individual ambition, anti-individual values. Gluttony. Gluttony is the overindulgence or overconsumption of anything to the point of waste. Of waste. By whose standard? Like when I go to a nice restaurant in Spain and have a 15-course prefix meal that lasts three and a half hours with a nice glass of wine, not with every course because I can't drink that much, but maybe a couple of glasses throughout of wine throughout the thing. 15 courses. Now, they're small courses, but still, it's a lot of food. Suddenly, to the point of waste, I don't, quote, need that. But man, is it fun. Man, is it good. Why is that gluttony? Yeah, I think I think by this definition, that's gluttony. I think when I go to my three-star Michelin-star restaurants, and, or two-star, one-star, and have a great meal that takes forever, and involves a lot of food. That's fantastic. That's fun. That's me indulging. I mean, by some standards, by Christian standards, certainly overindulging and spending a lot of money on it. A money I could have sent to charity. It's me being selfish. The pleasure of sitting down and eating. A lot sometimes. Sin. For example, one reason for its condemnation is that gorging by the prosperous may leave the needy hungry. Right? So the standard is not me. The standard is not my life. The standard is not my enjoyment. The standard is not my... Jennifer says, just diet the next day. You know the funny thing about these meals is, and, and I've, this has happened to me, uh, you know, because we do, my wife and I do these trips where we, we eat uh, for two weeks. We eat at great restaurants. It's surprising that we don't put on weight. I still don't understand quite the physics of it. We typically skip one meal, but but we're eating a lot of food. Um, I don't know what it is about it, the pacing of it, the 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 type of food, the quality of the food. The quality of the food is off the charts. I, I, you know, in terms of the ingredients, not just the flavor. Um, the fact that maybe we walk more than usual. But anyway, it's some of my favorite trips ever have been foodie trips. It's great. Um Medieval church leaders took an expansive view of gluttony, arguing that it also included an obsessive anticipation of meals. Oh, am I going to get that great meal at that great restaurant? Uh -uh -uh. Overindulgence in delicacies and costly food. I have committed this sin so many times. So many times. Aquinas listed five forms of gluttony. Eating too expensively, eating too daintily, eating too much, eating too soon, eating too eagerly. I have committed all five. I am clearly going to hell. Actually, I, I, we've been to a restaurant where, you know, somebody says 15 bites. 15 courses, which are not bites. I mean, there's a restaurant where we, we, we ate at in, in Paris, Pierre Gagnier, three-star Michelin restaurant. This is years ago. Pierre Gagnier also has a restaurant in Vegas, a very good restaurant called Twist in Vegas, which I highly recommend. This is where I could be a food critic, right, and, and recommend restaurant. Anyway, in, in the restaurant in Paris, it was 16 courses, and they were not small. They were big courses. They were big courses and a lot of food. And we couldn't, we were struggling. And we literally had to tell the French waiters, slow down. And they, were, they thought it was the funniest thing ever, these Americans with, with weak stomachs, little stomachs, and they can't, can't eat all this food. You know, we were there for probably four hours at least. No, over four hours, because we got there, I think, earliest, the earliest you can eat at eight. 
and we, we left after well after midnight. And we told him, slow down. You can't bring this fruit out this quickly. Slow. I mean, we, capacity is limited. Um, anyway, I mean, think about, again, the important thing to take from this is all of these Christian vices are targeting human pleasure, success, ambition, but pleasure. The anti-individual, the anti-pleasure, the anti-happiness. Greed, greed, also known as avarice, is like lust and gluttony, a sin of desire. However, greed, as seen by the church, is applied to an artificial, rapacious desire and pursuit of material possessions. So now we turn from the sexual to the food, food is very important, right? To other material possessions. This is all encompassing. And again, it's rapacious desire. Well, how do you define rapacious? What is artificial desire? I mean, is it greedy to want a Ferrari? At what point is it, why is this bad? They talk about hoarding of materials or objects. You know, I have a lot of art here. Does the, you know, I bought sculptures and stuff like that. Is that hoarding? Well, theft and robbery is including in this, but sure, theft and robbery, of course, are bad. No, nope, nobody's questioning that. Yes, the, the Wall Street greed speech is a really, really good speech from an evil character. And of course, it's a good speech only because it's from an evil character. That's the way the director thought of it. He's not going to give a good speech to a good character because he wants to undermine, to us, to me, it's a good speech, but not for Oliver Stone who directed the movie. For him, it's an evil speech. So he gives it to an evil character. So here's an attack on material possession. Here's an attack, this is the direct attack on ambition, on career, on wanting a big house, on wanting a big screen TV, on wanting the values that make your life enjoyable, on wanting the material values that make your life pleasurable, on wanting the material values because they symbolize your success on, to you, on wanting the material values because they make your life more enjoyable in every respect, and striving towards them, working hard to get them. Oh, you greedy bastard. And note, that greed is a single-minded pursuit of something. That's how I think of it. And, and there are periods of time in which a single-minded pursuit of money, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's an important thing for your survival, your flourishing, your success as a human being, and ultimately your happiness, because you want to attain a certain level of material well-being. And that material well-being is a value. Jesus, Time Walk is watching this on a 52-inch screen. I, I'm huge on a 52-inch screen. I don't know. I've got a TV downstairs that's 85 inches. And in televisions, size does count. There's no question. So it's all about stomping on ambition, particularly productive ambition. Again, stomping on an objectivist virtue, which is productiveness and everything it implies, the seriousness with which we take productiveness. Greed is explicitly about making more money. You, you see it used that way all the time. And it's about the, the gold you know, in, in Dante's Inferno, the money lenders have that bag of gold around their neck and it pulls them down towards the fire. Why? Because they're greedy for money. And again, what is hoarding? Who hoards? And what does hoarding even mean? And why is hoarding bad if you've earned it? If you've earned it, it's yours. The stuff I buy, I keep for myself. I might give gifts, but generally I keep it for myself. Greed. 
Linda says, what does Dante say about a 65-inch screen? Well, it depends on how many people you share it with. So the theme here is the denial of personal values, the denial, again, of pleasure, ambition, and so on. Sloth. Sloth refers to a peculiar jumble of notions dating from antiquity and includes mental, spiritual, pathological, and physical states. It's as an, you know, it defined as an absence of interest or habitual disinclination to exert oneself. Now, here's one. Okay, I, I'm sympathetic to this one. But it seems to be very wide. The scope is very wide, right? It's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's uh, spiritually, it's an affliction attended religious person, especially monks, where they become indifferent to their duties and obligations to God. That's sloth. You don't go to church on Sunday. You don't dedicate yourself to altruism. It's laziness, but laziness in a particular context. In a particular context. It's laziness Laziness in, just like in objectivism, pride is being morally ambitious. Here it's being morally inambitious, but think about the morality. The morality is a morality that undercuts your own ability, your own ambition, you know, pleasure, and so on, your own happiness. So being slothful in pursuing the commandments, being slothful in pursuing self-denial, but it certainly has certain positive aspects, in, in, positive in the sense of, yeah, I mean, being lazy is a vice. It is, goes against the virtue of productiveness. It goes against the virtue of rationality, right? It means not, it certainly goes against the virtual pride, the objectivist virtual pride. It means you're not taking yourself seriously. But again, the Christians don't quite mean it that way. So sloth is a sin of omitted responsibilities. It's not taking your Christian duty seriously. All right, let's see. What else do we have? Wrath. Wrath can be defined as uncontrolled feelings of anger, rage, and even hatred. Wrath often reveals itself in the wish to seek vengeance. In its purest form, wrath presents with injury, violence, and hate that may provoke feuds that can go on for centuries. <laughs> so... Again, if it's defined as uncontrolled, sure, anything uncontrolled is bad. But is this really against anger? Is it really against rage? Is it really against hatred? I have uh, said in the past that I'm, I'm, I'm not against wrath. I mean, I think being angry and being and hating are useful, important emotions that reflect your values. If somebody attacks your values and you don't feel anger, are they really your values? If somebody systematically attacks your values and you don't feel hatred, are those really your values? So anger and hatred are not something to be squashed. There's something to be observed. Something they are signals, they are messages that something is wrong, that something is bad, that somebody is a threat that needs to be dealt with. Now, dealing with anger and hatred or, or whoever's inflicting that on you could involve ignoring that, that person, what's going on, but it could involve fighting, lawsuits, physical fights in the case of, in some cases. And it's important to be willing to do that. Again, it's your values, you have to fight for them. 
So the battle between iPhone and Android, there's a battle? There's no battle. I mean, one is for winners and one is for losers. There's just no, there's no battles being won. Um, so, yes, it's true that uncontrolled, but uncontrolled anything. I mean, I'm pretty angry at our politicians. I'm angry at the FDA. I, 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 I hate some of our politicians, many of them, actually most of them. I hate I even feel vengeful against our political class. It's not uncontrolled. It's very much under control. I don't let it dominate my life. I don't let it distort my ability to be objective. I don't let it stop my ability to be rational and to live and to enjoy and to be ambitious and to have a great life. But it's there because it's reality. My values are being attacked. And <laughs> that's not good. And logically, rationally, from a light perspective, that invokes a negative emotion, as it should. All right. Um, so, this is really all of these uh, uh, anti values. The anti-values. If you don't want anything, you will never be angry. If you don't desire, you will never hate. Christianity, the whole structure of these vices is to deny you your values, your pleasure, your happiness, your life. And when you do pursue your pleasure, your values, your ambitions, your life, you feel guilty. And Catholic Church certainly, through confessional, but the Christian Church generally has ways to deal with guilt, which involve control. You set up a moral system nobody can achieve. You make everybody the sinners constantly. I mean, just, yeah, try driving lust out of human, human beings. Everybody's lustful, therefore everybody's a, sin, a sinner. Therefore, what? Therefore, everybody feels guilty and therefore everybody can be controlled. Guilt is the means by which I control you. It's a tool for control. And it's a tool to deny you, to deny you existence and to put you under my thumb. <laughs> envy envy like greed and lust is characterized by an insatiable desire it can be described as a sad or resentful uh, you know a, a, a you wanting desiring other people's possessions note here that again Envy is focused on other people's possessions. It's, I want, I want the, the, I want that. I want what they have. Note how Ayn Rand describes envy or defines envy. It's hating. It's a form of hatred. Envy is a form of hatred. Hatred of the good for being the good. It's not, I'd really like to have a Ferrari the, like that guy's one day. That's not Ayn Rand's definition of envy. It's, I hate that guy for having the Ferrari. That's the kind of envy Ayn Rand has described. It's, you know, you could you could be jealous of a guy having a, a Ferrari. You could go, wow, that's so cool that he has a Ferrari, that he's earned what is necessary in order to achieve a Ferrari. But I, And I'd like one one day. That's I'm jealous. But to be envious is to hate the guy for having it. <coughs> it's 
rejecting other people's achievements. It's not, in Ayn Rand's view, not about wanting more. But here it is. There's an aspect of it in Christianity that it's about wanting more. It's about not coveting things your neighbor has, but why not? Well, in a zero-sum world, if your neighbor has it and you don't, the only way for you to get it is to take it from your neighbor, some neighbor, somewhere. But But it's, you know, it's here it's, you shouldn't cover what your neighbor has, but I cover what my neighbor has all the time. I don't steal it. I sometimes see my neighbor has something that I I don't have and I go, wow, I'd like that. Like I have an 85 inch TV. Some guy has 110 inch TV. I want one of those, right? It's not because he has it that I want it. It's because the fact that he has it, well, I didn't realize they make the TVs this big and I want one too. And I'm going to make some money so I can earn enough money so I can buy it. Yes, and Frank says the envious guy would scratch the other guy's Ferrari with a key. Yes, because the Ferrari represents hatred of the other guy for having it. So envy for Christianity, the way it's defined here, is focused on the desire for stuff. For Iran, it's the hatred of the producer. The hatred of the good for being the good. Not the desire for the stuff. And again, it's it's envy is is the way it's describing Christianity is the assumption of zero sum. All right. Lastly, and most importantly the deadliest of all sins is the sin of pride, is the sin of pride. And, and this is, you can see this direct contradiction with both Aristotle and Ayn Rand. Aristotle called pride the crown of the virtues. Pride is to be ambitious about the virtues. Pride is to do your best with regard to virtue. Pride is to be the best that you can be, the best human being possible. It's about moral ambitiousness. It's about being good. It's about trying to be perfect. And of course, for Christianity, this is a sin. You cannot be perfect. You should not want to be perfect. You are nothing and a nobody. Pride is considered the original and most serious of the seven sins because it's the most selfish. It's not about lust. Animals have that. Fine, you can have it. It's not about gluttony. Well, everybody has to eat, so you're eating too much. Okay, fine. This is about you being ambitious about not a Ferrari, That's maybe envy or gluttony or whatever, right? You being ambitious about your own life, about your own soul, about your own character, about who and what you are. You wanting to achieve happiness, you wanting to achieve for you life. To view pride as a vice is to reject self-interest. It's to reject selfishness. It's to reject you and to reveal that what Christian morality is all about, it's not even about the altruism in a sense of others. It's about self-denial. It's about self-sacrifice. It's about not being happy. It's about not living a good life. It's about not having a good life. And, and this is the, you know, the American version of Christianity. It says, oh, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to make a lot of money. That's only in America. 
And it's kind of a modern perversion of the Christian faith. But Christianity essentially wants you to suffer, wants you to grovel, wants you to be dependent, wants you to be humble, to recognize, recognize, and we'll get to humility when we talk about the virtues, right? To recognize that you are a sinner, to recognize that you are nothing, to recognize that you are nobody, to recognize that you don't deserve the Ferrari, you don't deserve the, the, the sexual pleasure you get, you don't deserve that great meal. You are nothing, nobody. You are just a servant of God's, an insignificant speck in the universe. And who are you to raise your head? Who are you to have pride? Who are you to think of yourself as able and competent and, and, and successful and moral? It's not about, pride is not about other people. It's not about your view about yourself relative to other people. It's about your view of yourself relative to you. Relative to you. Don't admire yourself too much. And don't try too much to be the best that you can be because it's futile. It's futile. You want to be humble. Humble means putting yourself down. Humble mean recognizes your own weakness, metaphysical weakness as a human being. And it's been labeled by the Christians. Again, notice the, the contrast. Aristotle, crown of the virtues. Christianity, father of all sins. The devil's most prominent trait. C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity that pride is the anti-God state. Yes. The position in which the ego and the self are directly opposed to God. Yes. Why? Because it's the position in which the ego, the self, is central, is the purpose. You become the purpose of your life. And that can't be right because God must be your purpose. God must be central to your life. You must be a slave to God. And what's it associated with? Notice that whenever they take something like this, it's not just that you lust, the lust is going to lead to rape. It's not just that you want really good, nice food. It's you're going to deny other people food and you're going to eat until you're sick, right? It, 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 and with pride, this is how C.S. Lewis describes having pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison to God. It is through pride that the devil becomes, became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Which means self-interest is the complete anti-God state of mind. Selfishness is the complete anti-God. Taking your life seriously is the complete anti-God. Uh, another writer writes, spiritual pride, spiritual pride, pride in your own intellectual ability, I guess, in your, in your, in your character. Where, is, where did I, what was that quote? That was good. Spiritual pride is the worst kind of pride. If not, if not worse snare of the devil, the heart is particularly deceitful on this one thing. Pride is the worst viper that is in the heart, the greatest disturber of the soul's peace and the sweet communion with Christ. So, Christianity wants to deny self, wants to deny pleasure, wants to deny values, individual values, and wants to deny ambition. And therefore it has to deny pride. 
moral ambitiousness, focused on self, nothing is worse than that. Now, while this particular version of Christianity might not be dominant in the culture, take every one of those and think about examples in your own life where this is out there, where maybe it's from your own childhood, maybe it's out your mother, what your mother talked about. Or taught you. How your preacher teaches you. And look. Sure. For every one of these. You can turn it into a sin. A, a real sin. Pride can be. You know. If you're boastful. And you're arrogant. About things that. You don't. You don't deserve credit for. Sure. That's a sin. But that's not what they mean. You know. If, if you. If you. Are. Um, promiscuous in sex and you lust everything, that's a sin. If you eat to the point where you're throwing up and you're sick and you're, that's a sin. In the sense that it's unhealthy. I mean, any one of these could be turned into a sin, but that is not their essential characteristic. That is not what they're meant to do. They are meant to undermine your pride. They're meant to undermine yourself. They're meant to undermine your values. And they are massively impactful in the culture. Massively impactful in the culture in all kinds of ways. Christianity is the dominant ethical view in the culture, even though it's not held that way. I mean, almost all the secular moral views are fundamentally Christian, or essentially Christian, in that they reject self-interest. They reject pride. And therefore, they reject self-esteem and your ability to achieve self-esteem. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.